Could you please state your full name? It's Bill Van Gool. And your age? I'm 70 years old. And where were you born? I was born in Antwerp, Belgium. Okay. And as a child, what did your parents do for a living? My father had an automotive business, primarily automotive parts, but he also did some work on resurfacing brake drums and that sort of thing. So, but it was a very successful business right after the war that he started um, in r roughly 1946. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you as a child, what were your interests or pastimes? I spent a lot of time in the store because uh, people would bring in uh, broken parts from cars to have them replaced, old light bulbs, old drums, and I used to build these structures in our backyard. And uh, so I used old light bulbs and old pieces and created, sometimes I felt I was building computers, but of course it was all in my imagination, but it was a creative sort of the creative thing I, I, was, I liked to do. And was it more of a, did you create more structural things or was it more electronic things? It was structural, okay. yeah, structural things, yeah. Right. So, a uh, precursor to yes. <laughs> what we'll be talking about in a moment. Yes. So, um, what about at school? Were there any specific classes you really excelled or liked? Uh, I was very good at drawing and geometry. I excelled in geometry. I was always number one in a class with geometry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I still, you know, on occasion when I need to apply for spe for special permits somewhere, I need to have sort of a background. You have to give uh, the association of an engineering association. You have to give your background and whatever your interests are. And I often refer back to those early days of my involvement with geometry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if I'm not mistaken, you actually came to Canada before going to university? Yes, okay. that's correct. So, um, so yeah, may I ask why um, you and your family came to Canada and how that happened? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my dad was in this automotive business and he started it after the war. It was a real booming time in Belgium. And towards the early 60s, that boom started to diminish to the point that my father, we had, you know, he had 11 children, he realized, and he was also an accountant, so he knew that the business was not really supplying enough resources or funds to keep this family going. And uh, he was, he went to to Antwerp quite a bit to buy products for the business. And when he walked down town in Brussels, he saw a big billboard at the, uh, like a window of the embassy, the Canadian embassy in Brussels. And on, the, on this window, it said, come to Canada. And there was all these pictures of Peggy's Cove and mountains and prairie fields. He thought, oh, wow, I think I'll go in there and have a look, you know, talk to them. And he spoke to a, a person there, uh, probably in a, you know, an attache or whatever in, in, in the embassy. And they said, Mr. Van Gool, you're exactly the kind of family that we want in, in Canada. And we're going to help you get established in Canada. We want to go to Montreal because we could speak French. But they said, no, no, Montreal is too big a city. You need to go to Saskatoon. And of course, we'd never heard of Saskatoon. We looked on the map. We found it in the middle of the prairies, you know. And uh, they said, no, no, this is where you should go because this is, at that time in 1964, it was the fastest growing city in Canada. So they said this would be the best best for you. You'd have the most opportunities. Do you think maybe it was also fastest growing because they were trying to send most <laughs> Possibly. No, it was also the, the early days of potash, potash mining. Okay. So that is, uh, potash was discovered. They found large resources there. And they said, mm -hmm. and a lot of people went to Saskatoon because of the potash boom starting okay. in, in 1964. Right. And yeah, it is the largest uh, exporter of mm -hmm. in the world, is Saskatchewan, yes. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so you were 18? I was 18 when okay. I came to Canada. And what were your first thoughts of Canada? What, uh, if you were to compare um, your first reactions, your first emotions, sentiments? Mm -hmm. Well, when we arrived in Montreal, that was very similar to a big city in Europe, where, you know, we're from Antwerp, Belgium, um, in Brussels. 
uh, that was all very common to us and, and kind of interesting, a bit European looking as well. But then we went to Saskatoon, it's like a, a prairie town, very low buildings, low rise things, no high rises and very wide streets, no traffic jams. So that first impression was, oh my, you know, this is, where are we now, you know? My dad always was wondering also if they had street lights, you know, because he thought something from the movies, you know, the old movies and up out west, but it, it was, fairly well established when we got there so it's uh, there was not so much of a shock after a few days you know we got used to it and, and it, you know we did very well yeah good mm -hmm. so um by that time you'd be going or thinking of going to to college or university yeah well uh, we first went to like my sister and i were similar age which she's only one year apart we went to high school and i was put a back one year so okay. that I could sit in the class with my sister because we couldn't speak English, right? So we had to learn as we, we went. We arrived in September and it was also, September is also uh, the month that school starts. So we, there was really no time to learn English. We just went to school and managed from there on. Wow. Okay. And what did you decide to, uh, or what were your intentions for for a, a future a career my i always want to be an architect because I, I like the building and i want to be to do architecture but uh, there was no school of architecture in saskatoon and my parents could not afford to send me to edmonton i think it was the one in edmonton or calgary so they said oh no you better choose something that is right here in this town so there was a school of engineering so I went to engineering, College of Engineering in Saskatoon. Okay, and what kind of engineering? The structural, like civil, civil engineering. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so f from there, what would you consider your uh, first job after your degree? Well, uh, when I, I really enjoy, like after four years of engineering, I've I really enjoyed the computer aspects, and this is now in 1970. So computers were all not that prevalent in design. But I, I could see a future in engineering and computers com combining both. And really the university did not offer any special courses in engineering and, and, um, and computers. So I, I found an advertisement in a newspaper in Saskatoon for a college, a computer college in, uh, in Ottawa. So I came to Ottawa specifically to take this course, computer course. And I was always thinking of going back to Saskatoon. But I also realized when I was in Ottawa that I really couldn't do both, is to go to school and to support myself. It wasn't going to work, so I thought, well, I, I should get a, maybe get a job first, get myself established in Ottawa and then while I have a pro while I have a job pursue the computer aspect of of uh, engineering that didn't exist yet though right now uh, computer engineering is a very oh popular mm -hmm. some group of engineering That's like at right. Ottawa U for example but yeah. uh, it yeah. wasn't back then I'm not not at that time oh. no <clears throat> so I I thought I better get a job and I well I went to the unemployment office and went there just about every week and then uh, at one point this the people at the office there said we have something something just came in from a company called Fentimans, a Fentiman and Sons they're looking for a draftsman so and they said well come back in the afternoon we'll have it all written up and then you can go and see the Fentiman and Sons and talk to them about this uh, you know, drafting uh, position. So next day I went to see Fentimans and they were doing this work. They had a small division called Triodetic. So this Triodetic, I was hired as a draftsman, even though I had an engineering background, I was ready to do anything and uh, started as a draftsman at, at Fentiman and Sons. That was a window and door business.
Okay, windows and doors. Yeah. Okay. And um, I guess from there. What you... <clears throat> well, the the wind uh, they had uh, they had Art Fentiman, who was one of the sons of the Fentiman Son Company, uh, had invented a system that would interconnect tubular components into a hub. And it was a very efficient jointing system. And I was, I was really fascinated. And they had done some interesting structures by the time I was hired uh, to help in the drafting area of the triadetic aspect of the triadetic division. So... Um, what, was, um, what was specific within the triadetic division as opposed to the rest of the company? The, the triadetic division, they were already exploring to build dome structures with the system because the system was so versatile. It could do dome structures, it could, could build flat space frame structures, could build vertical walls. It's very, very, very different. And uh, also, that system, I could recognize right away that it, it would suit very well to uh, computer design because there are so many components and uh, to do everything by hand manually would be a very cumbersome process. So I could see where I could already apply the, the little knowledge I had of computers to applications that they were working on. So that's, that's and then I did sort of self-teaching, self-learning, applying computers, and, and I had some, I had Fortran language, at the time it was called Fortran language, uh, experience, so programming was something I enjoyed doing, and Tridic was a natural thing for me, and because I was also interested in architecture, it was it had an architectural aspect to it, a structural aspect. So it's like, oh, this is perfect, right. and I'm still in it now. It's yeah. amazing. That's like forty-five years of doing yeah. triodetic. So, and because of its. Um, I mean, everything is custom, right? Every, every everything is, order is different. So uh, yeah. architecturally, that's, mm -hmm. that's a great aspect of yes. the triadetic yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you also keep going to school? Because your plan was to get the, get a job, but also... No, I never... No, I no? felt okay. that I could, I could manage right. the applications that I, I needed. Um, and so much uh, of the learning was done. Yeah, in, so I, at work. I had enough background that I could actually continue to to expand uh, computer applications. Really, that's I didn't. I don't think I needed anything more than what I was doing. You know. Yeah. So can you just go uh, quickly through your your career here, but also maybe a little bit of the history of Triadetic as well? Yeah. The the system. To go right back to the requirement, as I mentioned, uh, it, uh, F. Fentiman and Sons was a window and door company, and they had a requirement from the Canadian government to get involved in a very large door to be constructed in the north. And the only way that this was for the uh, for the Air Force at the time, and all. This door would have to be flown in in components. So Art Fentiman developed a system where tubing could be formed in individual components and packaged very compactly <clears throat> and then shipped to the north. So that was the very first project that Triodetic, or at least Fentiman and Sons did, was to build this very large hangar door shipped by, by aircraft, small aircraft, to a northern community. So that's mm -hmm. the background um, of how Triadetic sort of became a structurally a structural system with a very good application. And they also, I think it was 1967, was the Expo 67 in Montreal. So they were then brought in to do other things. So some architectural structures were built at Expo oh, 67 right. using the triadetic system. Okay. Yeah. And I guess you were saying it um, started up north with the, with the mm -hmm. north. Yeah. So it would, triadetic now had access to all sorts of very um, 
niche or isolated markets, I guess, right? because right. it was so much easier to transport yeah. all this yeah. structure as opposed to it's, anything yeah. else. And, and especially even now, we still find the aspect that it can be such compact shipping is being a benefit to us as against competition or competitors who would build large trusses and would have to ship them by truck. We can fly things in in the very compact mm -hmm. uh, containers right. and all over the world, actually. So if, if um, someone were listening to this who knows nothing about triadetic or structures, in layman's terms, how would you explain a very simple system that triadetic? It's um, a lot. It's it's a prefabricated system, and uh, it's put together uh, very quickly using, for instance, one connector can hold eight pipes. You can also... Pipes are made of steel? Pipes are made of steel or aluminum. And uh, so it's a prefabricated system that interconnects tubular components. And you can make a very large array of, of components. So the structures can be something from a very small dome, let's say a two meter dome, to as much as a hundred meter diameter domes that we're building now using this structural system. Mm -hmm. The same system. Mm -hmm. How, what's the biggest structure uh, that's ever been built? The biggest structure we've built so far is in Peru, and it's a 110 meter diameter dome. So that's that's getting up there. Yeah. It's uh, 350 foot or something diameter. So wow. that's a very large structure. Yeah. Right. So now you uh, you own the company, Trident, or Well, I, I let me sort of, uh, I own, I used to own the company. Okay. I just recently sold the company. Ah, okay. so, because, you know, at 70, I should right. think of, div you know, divesting myself of my er right, right. of my owning, but I'm still, I feel like still own the company, but it's now, you know, technically owned by others. But okay. uh, I'm still a fixture here, apparently. I'm still still at my desk. Any, mm -hmm. uh, any plans of retiring anytime soon? Uh, no, I don't no. think anybody wants to hear that word retirement from me. <laughs> no, no. It seems to be a recurring theme in uh, this this project, these interviews. Is that right? Even when people tell me they're retired, I find out they're not very, no. they're not fully retired. No, no. It seems it seems hard to uh, quit working True. <laughs> in this uh, in this domain. You're right. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, if I were to ask you maybe about your more most challenging or even go as far as saying dysfunctional um, part of your career or project you had to work on or something like that, is there one that comes to mind? Well, dysfunctional does not come to my mind, so that's been very good for me. Um, but as far as a structure that is, is very unique and was a challenge, and uh, never built before by this method. This is a project we did in Chile for a mining company. And uh, it's called the Escondida Mine in the Atacama Desert. So it's, in, again, a very remote place to build. And uh, Tridetic was perfect for that because of our ability to, const to use small components for big structures. And um, it had a very unique uh, installation method, which we developed, never tested before. So it was all very new, and uh, I had several sleepless nights, but um, I felt that we could do it, and I had enough done enough tests to assure myself that this could be done structurally. It's a, very, a big structure, it's some 60 meters wide, and I believe 150 meters long. And in addition to, it is used as a cover for a stockpile, copper stockpile. But the biggest challenge was that in the top of this barrel vault shaped roof, there was also a train. So the, our structure is holding a train that travels back and forth to deliver, they call it a tripper, but it is it is a piece of equipment that travels through the roof to the top of the roof, and it deposits material in into this into the building. 
So it is a top-loaded building. Wow. So the full length of it, there's a train track in the roof, and this machine travels back and forth with a conveyor attached to it to deposit materials. So, so that had to be extremely strong. It had to be extremely strong. So the triadetic, in, in addition to the triadetic components, we also have structural steel components. So it's, it's a really, it's a blend of two systems, conventional structure system and the triadetic system. Okay. But it is, it was sort of like, okay, I was sticking my neck out to some extent and, and never really knowing if, well, I had confidence that we could do it, but then there's always this little bit of doubt that you know, that keeps you sort of... Something goes wrong. Yes, what if? Yeah. What if this whole concept doesn't really behave the way we think? Right. But that wasn't the case. It worked out. It worked, very, worked yeah. very well. Yeah. So what's... Um, I don't know if there's a limit, but do you, is there a number to how much weight uh, triodetic structures can support? As long as we combine it with conventional steel, there really is, is no limit. Uh, Tridec by itself has, has a limit because of our, the tubular system is a fairly light gauge right. tube. It's not a heavy pipe. It's uh, not a, it's, it's, it has some limitations, but we are using Tridec for 300 foot or 100 meter diameter dome. So the, without structural steel right. assistance, so it, it has a, uh, has capacity, but I would think that is probably the limit, you know, 100 meters to 110 meter diameter dome. And the reason the dome shape has its own inherent structural capacity because of its double curvature. And that is another benefit. That's why when we see a structure or we have a requirement for covering a structure, covering an area, we usually steer the client towards a dome shape because the triadetic has, is most efficient used in dome shapes, okay. dome curvature. The double curvature is really what helps us. Mm -hmm. And uh, throughout your career, would you say you've had um, one or a few mentors? Yeah, my mentor is really Art Fentiman, the developer of the system. He, he was a great guy, very practical. He, was, he did not have engineering background, but he had a very good intuitive sense of structures. And when he developed a triadic system, he also sensed, even though we would have to do calculations of what tube sizes to use, he had an intuitive sense of what tube sizes or what he thought would best suit this particular application. And I learned a lot from him as to how to work a project through a project is to is to just uh, you know work it steadily, don't get overly excited, just kind of work from the basics. And this is the way he dealt with most challenges. Even when you're building something and something goes wrong or something's not quite working the way, you just approach it in a very calm manner. And you come up with some good solutions. He was amazing, really. I, I admired his abilities, and he's very good as a human being as well. You know, very, very friendly, very easy to work with. Mm -hmm. And he, in fact, he received the Manning Award. Um, I don't. You may want to do some research on exactly what the Manning Award is, but uh, it is. It is to. Um, celebrate Canadian um, technology and Canadian people that are, have done done well. Um, it's actually a Manning Award uh, was established by the father of Preston Manning. Okay. So he, I think he, he may have been in government in Alberta, Mr. Manning. But it was a Manning Award was established to recognize special contributions by Canadians. Right. And Art Fentiman was, was one the of the one. award award winners of the Manning Award. Mm -hmm. Comes also with a, a financial um, benefit as well, that award. Yeah. Oh.
So we'll get we'll get a bit uh, more into the actual um, structures and things like that as mm -hmm. we were just talking about. Um, but historically, I don't, I don't know if you can answer this, but when Tridetic or the system was first developed, do you know if it was in response to a clear problem or um, a clear lack of something in architecture engineering where they they thought there must be a solution to this, and that's how they developed uh, the system? Well. Uh it was really the requirement of this 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 large door because right, phantomans okay. the door yeah there. because phantomans they were building wooden doors and sometimes metal doors and it just the, the fact that this had to be a very large door in metal that created really that's where arch phantom had to you know put his mind to to something very special that would would accommodate this requirement. So this really goes back to the door uh, right. requirement again. That was a challenge. But as I mentioned earlier, um, the the Tridex system is very adaptable. I mean, the very first time was a door, but then now we are getting involved with structures in the north for permafrost applications. So that's another. That was my next so, question. So that's the the the. It seems like we're always finding new opportunities to apply the product in f different aspects that we would never have thought of at first. Right. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about the uh, most recent solutions, uh, sorry, problems and then solutions yeah, the, triadetic, such as permafrost? The permafrost, to... yeah, permafrost um, applications actually stemmed from, um, there, there was, the National, yeah, National Research Council of Canada were looking into different foundation systems in the north because permafrost is an ever-changing soil condition. It could be frozen one year and not so frozen. And now with climate change, there is a softening of permafrost, which means some of the buildings that were previously sitting on frozen ground are now on soft ground and are cracking. So the National Research Council was doing some research as to what, how can we get around this problem? And they knew that we were able to build space frames. So this is, would be like horizontal st structural systems. And they felt that if they could build a building on three points, then you have a stable system because a three point is, is, is the most stable condition you can have. So they, they contacted us to build a flat space frame and put it on three points. So it could be built in the north. So we built that and it was, was successful. It, it worked very well, but I saw a limitation in that it would probably not, we could not make very large structures. Because if you build very large structures on three points, that means you have only three points of support, which also means you would have very large forces on the ground in a ground condition that is poor. So that intuitively, that didn't work as far as I'm concerned. So I felt, why don't we put that whole slab onto multi points, like have every component, all the joints, are sitting on the ground on plates. So it's like a more, more or less like a floating slab sitting on many, many points. Mm. And so that was tested as well. And it had, had great results because in that case, you wouldn't just have three, you'd have many points. But to be the, let's say if a space frame had 100 base plates, not all 100 need to sit on the ground. You could have some floating, as long as you have enough rigidity within the system. So that has become now, for us in Triadetic, that's, that's become a really interesting application. And we have used um, this, this system now in Russia, in Norway, we're in Alaska, we're in Northern Canada. So it has the permafrost, which is now because of global warming is becoming softer. Um, our applications are actually expanding. The use of it is expanding. Mm -hmm.
right? And you've, uh, it makes it a lot easier also to even move or relocate houses, right? That's right, because you could pull it away, you could actually drag it. And uh, in Shishmaref, Alaska, um, there are several, this is a town that's been there for hundreds of years, and it's on the coast of the Chechi Sea. And the Chechi Sea is eroding the coastline, and some of the buildings are actually fell into the into the sea. So we went in there some years back to take measurements of the existing buildings that are on the edge of this cliff, and we lifted the building, put a triadic underneath, and put our triadic structure on skis, like metal ski and then waited for winter and we pulled them with bulldozer we slid them a kilometer away and we did I think some 28 of these these uh, homes and there is another neighboring community that has the same issues uh, don't recall the name but we were now working with that community to move them also away from the shoreline right Speaking of shore too, is uh, you're doing a bit of work as well, more south um, with flooding, right? Yes, flooding the application. Uh, so the similar approach we're using now in flooding regions where we provide stability to the, to the building using the triadic. And then if you have a flood situation, at least the building is, is, is intact. You, there might be lots of water there, but it's not going to be differentially. You're not going to have erosion of certain portions of support. Even if you have erosion, it functions as a as a full slab. Right. And the, and also to expand on that, we did a lot of remedial work in Alaska again. Um, in uh, don't Al Alakakat, which is a community that was is on the on the river and the river overflowed and the whole Alakakat region was underwater. So we went in there and lifted buildings and put our structure underneath. And can you often lift the buildings high enough that when there is flooding it doesn't actually touch the, right. the house? Yeah. The ones in Alakakat we lifted five feet oh, wow. um, and put our structures underneath. So they are elevated and usually the rivers, I mean they're not going to go that high but um, that is the limit that the, that we were given of the so in the event of you know if it goes up to four feet they're still in a dry area but you know the base of your home would still be in a dry area what would you say um, up, up till today what is triadetics best um, best and most unique characteristics as a product is the versatility of shape. Uh, we can, uh, the dome structures is, is one, it's not a standard structure that people can readily fabricate. We can make dome shapes very quickly. We can also do free form shapes and uh, because the system really adapts very easily. It's all computer controlled, computer designed. Uh, the Although there are many components, uh, the fabrication is so readily, easily done. Our press, our system, our fabrication system um, allows for easy and very precise variations in angle uh, of tubular component, the angle that is fixed to it. So in that way, we can do freeform structures like I don't think there's another system that can do right. it as well as triadetic. It's simply mm -hmm. yeah. that custom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very customized. Mm -hmm. um, now, speaking of the actual customization and the making of these these pieces, um, take us through the process of getting these pieces, what they are, mm -hmm. how you transform them. Yeah, we we have uh, the jointing system. Well, there are two main components. There is the central joint, which is made of aluminum. And the joint itself has grooves in it, and they're like keyways. So the keyway is very much like, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a um, 
it's like a pine tree shape. The keyway is a pine tree shape. And we take tubing, we, we bring tubing in from a factory to us. So the tubing comes in long lengths and we form the, the ends of the tubes with the same keyway, the same pine tree shape at the end of the tube. And then we slide that keyway into the slot. So um, the raw materials is really, again, very simple. The, the, the hub, the aluminum hub, we buy that in long lengths with the keyways extruded in them. And we slice them to suit the application. And the tubes come in long lengths. Could be aluminum tube, could be steel tube. It could be varying wall thicknesses. We put them through a pressing operation and we press the end of the tubes with this keyway design. And then we also put a stamp. We, we number them with a metal stamp because some structures may have 5,000 components and it could be 5,000 different components. So each component has its own number. Like a big puzzle. Like a big puzzle. You look for the right number and you slide it in the right slot and you can build some exotic structures. Mm -hmm. So the generally the two metals used are aluminum or steel? Steel, and it could be stainless steel. We've done some okay. structures and for the potash industry uh, in stainless steel for ultimate corrosion protection. All our tubing, if it's not stainless, uh, we use galvanized steel tubing. And uh, but you can also use aluminum tubing, and Which just be lighter. Yeah, much lighter, and also has the the corrosive ability. Uh, the aluminum is you know corrosive resistant, uh, so the applications are, are. We find that in our system, probably about eighty percent is steel, galvanized steel okay. tubing. Mm -hmm. Now, um, could you talk a bit about its application in the mining industry mm -hmm. and, and what kind of structures you do and, and why those structures? What do yeah, they, the, what's their purpose? Yeah, the mining, mining applications have been primarily because of um, environmental concerns. Um, many of the mining operations involve using conveyors, bringing materials in and, and creating stockpiles. And that whole operation of dropping materials from great heights to create stockpiles of, of a concentrated load in one area uh, creates dust because the materials f fall down and the wind carries the dust uh, far and wide. And for many years, this was ignored as a, as a, you know, that was just part of doing business in mining. But um, environmental concerns are, are uh, requiring more and more control of product. And that's where we've started to, to get involved. So our involvement in mining has been uh, as part of a dust control requirement. And also, a lot of these, quite a few of the mines are operating mines, and we can build our structures while the mine is in operation. So there's really very little impact on, on uh, product, you know, on, on operations. And uh, it's, uh, we build in place while the, uh, while the mine is operating. Right. And you had mentioned uh, before the interview one of your proudest um, structures, which is in uh, BC. Well, the, yeah, the, there's a mine, it's called Highland Valley Copper, Highland Valley Copper Mine, uh, in near Kamloops. And uh, it has been operating for the last 20 years, uh, creating dust for the last 20 years. And there's a community nearby called Logan Lake. And they've suffered dust, uh, not just Logan Lake, in the whole region, dust is traveling far and wide. And uh, I, I went to the mine uh, while it's in operation and the dust is everywhere. You, you're walking through, you know, sometimes a foot of dust. So 
it, it became an issue and uh, the workers were complaining about uh, dust prevalence everywhere. So we were involved in putting dome covers over each conveyor system, each um, stockpile location. There are three stockpiles, three in a row. And um, the client asked us to create the largest Canadian flag in the world by having um, the three domes. And the middle dome has the maple leaf, the very large maple leaf. Uh, in the middle of it, and it's a, an amazing structure. You can see it flying over. It's because it is each dome is a hundred meters. So if you put three, in, that means like three hundred or four hundred meter device down below three domes that uh, form the Canadian flag. So we're we're very proud of that, and you know it has, certainly has that sort of Canadian feel to it. And when we take it to that image of these three domes, we take that to our uh, trade shows in Chile and in Peru, and, and people immediately identify, you know, with, oh, it's a Canadian product, you know, the Canadian flag. Right, so, right. I, I actually so, I think I had seen the picture uh, at, a, at the Mine Expo. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. No, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun one for us. Yeah. So it's official, it's the largest flag in the well, Canadian flag? We like to think yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Certainly, the permanent, as a permanent installation, right. <laughs> there may have been some temporary installations that I don't know about, but certainly permanent, it's, it's the biggest, I right. think. Yeah. Um, last question about your, um, your career, but you also, I think, teach? I teach at Algonquin. Uh, at Algonquin. I'm a guest uh, lecturer, and uh, my guest lecturer is primarily to do with permafrost uh, applications. Also, I teach the students about permafrost and about building in permafrost, because right now in, in Algonquin College, uh, students are taught about construction, using foundations, like, you know, four foot below uh, grade to be away from um, frost, frost conditions. But in the north, everything is frozen. You cannot dig to build a foundation. You have to build on top of the... And this is something new that they don't really know about. So I teach that. Um, I don't, I'm not on their regular roster, but I'm, uh, I get invited to, to teach. But I did... I had a two-year involvement at Algonquin College teaching new Canadians uh, technology program on the weekends okay. so that they could be uh, could res uh, these would actually be foreign engineers who have an engineering degree from foreign lands but then have a difficulty finding work in Canada because their engineering degrees are not recognized but they can obtain a technology degree and I was teaching uh, technology courses to bring them up to the level that they could actually get an Algonquin supported technology degree, which at least they would become employable in Canada as technologists. And if they wished, then they could also, from that point, expand to engineering and get an engineering degree. And in fact, I hired one of my students who's working with me now here in, in the office and uh, he's since also become a professional engineer. So he's taught, he's, he's took it one extra step from the technology that allowed me to, to employ him to now he's one of my engineers. Mm -hmm. um, a few opinion questions here and there's mm -hmm. no wrong answer. But the first one would be, do you believe there's a disconnect between the natural resource world and the general public. And when I say natural resource world, mm -hmm. it could be anything from mining to metallurgy um, to mm -hmm. uh, the oil industry, anything like that. It's hard to answer that question. Um, I, I do recognize a bit of a disconnect because I have experienced a disconnect myself. When I go on mining sites, I know we are there as 
we are providing dust covers. So we're doing an environmental, we are acting as an environmentalist to some extent, but that that is a very limited function where we do dust control. But mining by itself, and I don't think people realize that mining is, is, is not a pretty engagement, you know, it, 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 and there are things you have to do to, to the environment to get at the natural pro at these products. So, but the disconnect I see is that not everybody realizes that yes, we do need copper, we do need metals, and we have somehow, in order to get them, you need to disturb nature. So that I see the disconnect there. Um, it's very difficult to have that appreciation unless you realize yourself that you, you are consuming metals all the time, cars, electrical wiring, cell phones, uh, cell phones, all these, you know, precious metals, copper, copper, zinc and coal. And, uh, uh, and there are many, many, many products, aluminum, all these things you need to, they are in the earth and you need to get at them. And there's really no, no nice way of doing it. So we are contributing in a way we're creating a dust cover. So I'm, I'm a little bit between, we are involved in mining, which is not the cleanest operation, but at least we're functioning in something that is helping the environment, right? I'm trying to make it cleaner. Make it cleaner, yeah. And um, I guess um, this alludes to the, the environment aspect, but in your opinion, are there any events, people, inventions, contributions, disasters, any type of topic really uh, that you think must be mentioned when we talk about the history of the natural resources in Canada? Big question. <laughs> I think you should stop because <laughs> I, I, I thought I made some. <clears throat> so a few closing questions. First one is what are you proudest of in life? And I can divide that in life and proudest of professionally mm -hmm. as well. Well, professionally, I can say that uh, the triadic system is is here to stay. And uh, I'm very proud that uh, I started when I was, I think, 25 years old, when I got involved with triadic, and that I've been able to keep, keep it going and keep it fresh and keep it interesting for me for all that time. So I th I'm very proud of that. And also that we have um, been able to employ people in a very, you know, very amicable way. I don't recall any any issues with with uh, my staff that you know that would be detrimental. It's just been a very good experience all this this time with Trianetic, and people have always enjoyed working with Trianetic. And when somebody came to me and said, you know, Bill, I, I'm, I think I'm moving on, I'm going to, I would always, I always welcome that and said, you know what, this is great, you know, you see another opportunity, take it. And I would support them and I said, this is what you're good at, this, or if I let somebody go, I would say, you know, this is not working out, but you are better at this or that, you know, so I always gave, felt like sort of more of a positive aspect and that, has worked very well for me. It's a good philosophy that I now teach other people in my in my group. You know, the, the senior management people say so just always encourage uh, involvement in business or in career. You know. And the uh, last question is: If you were speaking to someone much younger, for example, a student, mm -hmm. uh, what would you what would be the one life lesson or piece of advice you would give them? looking forward at their career? <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, I have this, I can show it to you later. I have this plaque, which used to be in my office. It's now sitting in the middle of our office. And um, and it states that keep, it, it has actually, there is a, a goose sitting on the water. And uh, I think basically what it says, keep calm on top and paddle like hell underneath. And this is sort of, that's my advice. You just kind of work hard, but you know, just keep calm and paddle like hell underneath. So this is my philosophy. Also, if you're doing a task, 
I take the worst task first so that the rest is easy go so yeah. I pick the most difficult save the best for last save the best for last that's, yeah that's good advice yeah good well thank you is there anything else you'd like to add mm, nothing I don't think um, well except a sort of a, a statement about Canada because I'm an immigrant and uh, uh, also when I was teaching those immigrants these these new engineers, I could I could identify with where they were at because of where I was at when I was an immigrant, and uh, Canada has been very good to me. And uh, as I mentioned before, I'm I'm, I'm I'm one out of eleven children, and we came to Canada, and all eleven of us have done very well. So Canada is still a land of opportunity, even when now when I'm teaching. These students are still in touch with me, and they have some good jobs. So that's sort of my, I would say, that is um, something well worth mentioning, that uh, Canada has opportunities. Canada is a very gentle place, and uh, I think it's certainly for my family, and the rest of my family has been very good. Well, I'm happy to hear that. It makes mm -hmm. me proud to be a Canadian also. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you. <clears throat> You're welcome.